G'day folks, we're just back from our road trip to Darwin, well we're not just back, we, uh, we've been back for a couple of days, I've uh, cleaned the van out and I've uh, um, cleaned the car up and got everything unpacked which is the worst part of a holiday is coming home and having to unpack everything, really the only way to solve that problem is to just not come home, but we did. Um, this is the first video of a whole pile of videos relating to this uh, road trip to Darwin. I will warn you in advance, I had a lot of trouble with cameras and microphones and it took me a week of shuffling things around and swapping things about to finally, hopefully, sort the problem out. So I do apologise for the, uh, the um, bad quality sound that comes up from time to time, but um, what did this trip have entailed? Basically, uh, we... Uh, did uh, Monkey Mire, we saw some dolphins there, we went to, um, um, where did we go, Carnarvon, had a look around Carnarvon, uh, Exmouth, we went up there, saw my first real live dingo walking down the road, well hobbling down the road, but you'll see that. Uh, went out and had a wander through uh, Yardy Creek, that was pretty interesting, I uh, quite enjoyed that, didn't exactly plan on going for a big long walk, but uh, we did and it was well worthwhile doing. Um, better than a boat trip, I think. But anyway, um, never got to do any swimming on Ningaloo Reef because it was so crowded in the car park you couldn't get in. So that'll have to be another trip sometime. Um, after that, we went to uh, Caratha, checked out Denham, um, went to uh, Cossack, had a look there, but they had a... a, a, um, a fate thing on so that couldn't really get around there properly so uh, uh, we went into Port Hedland did a tour of the BHP uh, loading facilities in Port Hedland that was pretty good um, then after Port Hedland we continued north we uh, eventually got in the Broome we spent four days in Broome did a few things around there went out to uh, Cape Levick and had a look up there before we continued on through uh, went straight through Fitzroy Crossing and Halls Creek um, went into Kununurra, spent four days in Kununurra, went out to El Questro, went up to Wyndham, the furthest point you could go north on the road in Western Australia before we continued on through into Darwin spent a week in Darwin, did heaps of good stuff in Darwin uh, then came back to Catherine, spent an, uh, a couple of nights in Catherine, did Catherine Gorge uh, came back and uh, stayed at Lake Argyle, which is the top part of uh, the Ord River Dam, and did a tour on the on the cruise a cruise on the boat there, which was pretty nifty. Um, then what did we do? We um, uh, oh bungle bungle, that was amazing. Road in was crap, but that was amazing. <laughs> um, then we went into Derby and went on the Gibb River Road from the other end and went out to Tunnel Creek and Wagina Gorge and uh, that was pretty nifty um, and then um, what do we do back to Port Hedland for a couple of no for a night we did in Port Hedland before coming down the Great Northern Highway spent a couple of days around the Karajini area before we made our way home the whole trip was absolutely amazing I hope that you uh, watch this all the way through there are a few little tips and tricks and things I, I chucked in there as well um, and uh, well basically why sit here talking about it when you can watch it here you go well good day folks I'm sitting here on Cable Beach in Broome waiting for the sunset <laughs>
um, been probably on a road for about eight days now for our road trip from Perth to Darwin. Our day out of Perth, our first day was a wet, windy, pretty rubbishy sort of a day. Uh, at times, could barely see the road in front of us, the rain was that heavy. We were only probably a couple of hours out of town before it all came good. Very little rain, the odd shower here and there, but that was about it. Uh, still cold, but it was all good all the way through. To our first stop, and that was Galena River, uh, just uh, north of uh, Calberry. Anyway, I'm uh, not going to sit here gas bagging anymore. That sunset's going lower and lower, so I want to watch that. See you later. Bridge campsite. It's a couple of hours north of Geraldton, just about maybe 10 kilometres after the Calberry turn off. Uh, it's on the Murchison River, and um, if you go up the river, or it's actually down river, head that way about another 15 kilometres, 20 kilometres, you start to come into the um, Murchison Gorges, the Calberry Gorges. Absolutely brilliant place. This place is huge, this uh, camping area here. It's a 24-hour camping spot and there's heaps of places in here to park. Um, at the peak of period, it's pretty busy. Uh, I was actually surprised we got in last night because we uh, got in just on the last bit of daylight. And uh, But there was quite a few places still around here. Now there's two parts to it. We're on the northern side of the river and over there on the southern side, there's another huge area as well. Um, well worth stopping into. It's got its own toilet. There is a toilet dump facilities. You can see there's barbecue places, tables. It's a really good little setup. And uh, yeah, like I said, really worth coming into. Well, it's day two today. We stopped overnight at the Galena Bridge, which is uh, about a day's drive north of Perth. Great little spot here. It wasn't all that busy considering we got in late. But uh, our plans today is that we're heading for Monkey Mile. We're going to do a field stop at um, Billabong and um, then stop at uh, Hamlin Pool. We're going to have a look at the Stromatolites and uh, the, maybe have a look at the uh, telegraph station there. And, uh, continue on, go to Shell Beach and a couple other little spots and then we'll end up in Denham tonight to try to go to Monkey Mire but they're in the process of uh, rebuilding the place so there's a uh, it's not open at the moment but um, we're going to stay in town in a caravan park in town and we'll stop overnight in Denham so uh, yeah that's pretty much our plans for today
That's right, I said rocks that breathe. We're out here where the stromatolites are. Now stromatolites are um, the first living organism to be found on Earth. Well, it wasn't found on Earth, it to be, uh, to be on Earth. It's a single cell organism and uh, basically it produces oxygen. Now, gazillions of years ago, there used to be heaps of this stuff around all over the world and they would produce oxygen and then eventually other animals came along. So only I think three places left in the world where you can find um, these things and uh, this is one of them and um, uh, basically the reason why they're still here is because that water out there it's uh, extremely salty, too salty for anything that would be a natural predator for the uh, single cell organism to be, uh, for it to be eaten and, and that's why it survives here. Um, it's quite amazing though that they uh, can survive out of the water. When you think in summer here, that rock gets really, really hot. So it's quite surprising they can manage to survive. Anyway, I did a video on this region, the whole Shark Bay area, uh, a little while ago. I'll put a link down below to where that's located. Shark Bay is on the World Heritage Register and there are 10 possible areas that can qualify a place to become on the uh, register. You only need to have one of them to get on it. Shark Bay has four and just here is one of the reasons why it's made it so easy for um, this area to be put on that register. This here is the vermin proof fence from over there where the ocean is to over there where the ocean is at six kilometers roughly and they put this fence in all the way along here to keep all the uh, the vermin and the pests and things on that side of the fence where over this side they have removed everything foxes cats anything that is not native for this area has been removed from this spot here and um, and, and it's kept out. But we still got to get through. So how do they do that? When well, they do it with this grid we've got here. And if an animal comes close to the grid, this is what happens if it's turned on, which it should be. Ah, it's not turned on. We normally get a barking dog here. Ah, it's turned off. Oh, well, that's a bummer. But anyway, this is the fence. I told you the weather was going to get better as soon as we left Perth. It's getting bloody warm now. You can see I prepared this morning, I've got my thongs on. Let's go look at Shell Beach. Shell Beach is made up of millions of cockle shells and they reckon it's about 12 metres deep. Another great little spot is Eagles Bluff where you can usually see sharks and stingrays and manta rays swimming around in the water. Doesn't look like there's anything here today.
Our camp for the night will be at the Denham Seaside Caravan Park. On the far side of town as you enter, you'll find the Denham Caravan Park. It's right on the beach. The first bays as you come in look a little small, but towards the back they're a good size and easy to get your van into. There are some activities to keep the kids occupied, but there is no swimming pool. However, the safe ocean is right next door. They also have cabins and camping facilities if that's the way you travel. The toilet block near us seemed to be a little bit small, so I reckon it'd be pretty busy around scrub time. Overall, it's a pretty good place. Ask for a bigger bay up the back. The next morning we did what everybody else does here. We went to see the dolphins of Monkey Mire. I did a video on Monkey Mire before, so I'll put a link in the description for it. Uh, it's an early start this morning. We uh, left early to go to Monkey Mire to go see the dolphins. And, um, now that we've done that, we've got the van back on and we're heading for Carnarvon. We'll uh, go up and have a look at that uh, satellite space station thing they've got there and uh, have a look around town before we head off to hopefully Manelia Roadhouse. That's where we're planning on trying to uh, get a camp for the night. We'll be on the side of the road. The camp sites fill up pretty quick, so. Uh, I don't know, we'll see how we go when we get there, whether there's room for us. If not, we'll continue on until we find somewhere better. So that's pretty much our plan for today. This is a bit weird, it's like Boot Hill. You can see that road down there. That's where we've just come up. That's the road back to Perth. So that's the Northwest Coastal Highway. We'll follow that one all the way through to just south of Port Hedland when it will turn back into the Great Northern Highway and we'll continue north on that. But I tell you what, can you pick a better place to stop and have lunch?
Carnarvon tracking station here was uh, used when uh, the Apollo missions were going up into space so they could put the first man on the moon. You can see over the back here the uh, sugar scoop. It's facing the wrong way to us at the moment. It's got that name because it looks a little bit like a sugar scoop. Um, that was used to relay information between the spacecraft and NASA. They also have a museum down here, a space museum down here, which uh, apparently is pretty interesting to have a look at. Unfortunately on this trip I haven't got time to go in, so I'm going to leave that for another trip. The other thing Carnarvon is well known for is its plantations. They uh, grow lots of bananas around here. They, um, around about 1920 a fellow thought it looked like a good area to grow some uh, bananas. So he put a crop in and a couple of years later he sold his first crop and that was really what put Carnarvon on the map. All of a sudden everybody was growing bananas. It's one of Australia's big uh, banana plantation areas. A couple of years ago they also started uh, experimenting with mangoes and they're going off really well as, as well. Um, lots of crops and things are all uh, around here, grown around here. Uh, it's basically the food bowl for uh, Western Australia. So this is Carnarvon. I've uh, got a bit of a uh, different piece of information on uh, how many people actually live here. Um, and I've looked up and one place it says there's around 7,500 people live here and another place says there's about 10 or 11,000 people live here. In the uh, 1980s I came here and it wasn't pretty good to enjoy it, there's nothing worth looking at, but uh, they certainly have uh, done it up over the years. It's quite, uh, quite nice, especially along the river here. Carnarvon is just over 900 kilometres from Perth. It's the regional centre for the Gascoigne area of WA. The first European fellow to come here was Lieutenant Gray in 1839, ten years after Perth was settled. He named the Gascoigne River after a mate of his, Captain Gascoigne. He made a note that the area was good for agriculture. He wasn't wrong. The area was first settled in 1876 by the Browns and the Brockmans, who travelled from York to Carnarvon with 4,000 sheep. Brown settled on Bullathena Station and Brockman established Brick House Station. The name Carnarvon was named after Henry Herbert, 4th Earl of Carnarvon in 1891. With over a million sheep spread across the region, Carnarvon had one of the world's first ports to export livestock.
nearly a bridge rest area is a 24-hour stop with toilets and a dump point. As with most of these stops, if you're not in by around 2 or 3 o'clock, then there's not much chance of finding a spot to set up without camping in somebody else's space. So we'll head off and see what else we can find up the road.